Hello, and welcome to Scholars Hub at Home. I'm Allison Gampel, Associate Director of Alumni Programs at the Office of Alumni Engagement at York University. Thank you very much for joining us for today's lecture, Ukrainian Sovereignty and Identity, a critical discussion on the war in Ukraine with Dr. Karen A. Krasny, Professor at York's Faculty of Education. I accept the responsibility to acknowledge the land that I am on. Because we're not all gathered in the same place, the land I'm about to acknowledge might not be for the territory that you are on. Please take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory that you're on. The website nativeland.ca is a good resource for this. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of the university. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tuckeronto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Before we introduce our speaker today, I am excited to tell you that York is strengthening its position as a leader in creating a sustainable and inclusive world, placing in the top 35 post-secondary institutions in the respected Times Higher Education Impact Rankings. Find out, find out what else is happening at York by reading our monthly newsletter called York U Alumni News. If you don't already subscribe to it, please update your contact preferences on our website, which can be found at yorku.ca forward slash alumni and friends. That should appear on screen. Now we like to conduct a quick poll before the session begins. So the question today is, how would you rate your knowledge regarding the topic of today's presentation? The poll should pop up on your screen and I'll give everyone a moment to respond. Thank you very much. It's helpful for our speakers to know more about our audience. If you need help with the Zoom webinar, please feel free at any time to click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and enter your question. Our team is ready to help you. That same button can be used to submit questions for our guest speaker to answer during the Q&A period that will follow her presentation. Please note that all of your questions and comments are visible to our panelists and staff working behind the scenes. So we ask that you keep your comments relevant and respectful. Today's talk will be given by Dr. Karen A. Krasny. Dr. Krasny is a professor in the Language and Literacy Education Program within York's Faculty of Education. From 2007 to 2013, she conducted research in Ukraine, focused on cultural production and the construction of post-Soviet national identities. This research was funded through the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, also known as SSHRC, and the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. We are so delighted that you're here with our York University community today. Welcome, Dr. Krasny. Thank you, Allison. It's a pleasure to be here, and I want to welcome everybody. And thank you for your genuine interest in learning more about Ukraine and its struggles um, and the present conflict. I, I think it's important to acknowledge that I am coming to you from Treaty 1 um, territory on the traditional land of the Anishinaabe uh, in Inu and Dakota peoples and the homeland of the Métis peoples uh, and the Métis nation. Um, I am uh, going to begin uh, just to, um, to sort of give you an overview of what I'd like to accomplish in the next 20 to 25 minutes. Um, it is almost three months since Russia launched its unprovoked and, un and coordinated attack on Ukraine in what we now know is the largest conventional nation state to nation state military attack on a European democracy since the Second World War. Um, it has, I must admit, been incredibly challenging to prepare for today with the ch ch situation changing rapidly. In the last 48 hours, the troops held out in the Avostil steel plant in Mariupol surrendered to Russian forces. Finland and Sweden are at this time submitting their formal application to join NATO and as I was getting dressed this morning, my husband called to say that the first Russian soldier to stand trial for war crimes pleaded guilty. 
Uh, my aim this afternoon is to provide you with an introduction to Ukraine and insights into several key events so that you might contextualize the media reports and rhetoric coming to you daily um, and to examine the scope of the humanitarian crisis. Um, if there is time, I'd also like to spend some, a moment outlining the ways in which academic communities can take action. Um, so the, there we go. Um, I, this is a map of Ukraine. Uh, and, uh, and also uh, what I wanted to show here was also the, um, the NATO flank nations along the side. Um, there are, and I, will, I want to say right away, more detailed maps. Um, that you can access through York's library guide. And I believe Paula has put the, um, the uh, link inside the, um, in, the, um, in the chat. Um, there's only so many that I can put up here that are in the open, uh, that are open source. So ideally I would have liked to have some of the, the um, uh, progress on, and the um, uh, occupations listed in terms of, of the present conflict. Um, but I, um, I wanted you, as you're looking at this map, to consider um, a few things. Um, my husband has always claimed that in order to win at the board game of risk, you have to main contr maintain control of Ukraine. Um, at more than 600 square kilometers, 600,000 square kilometers, Ukraine is the second largest country in Europe after Russia. It is strategically located between Central Europe, Russia, and the Middle East, um, and of course has the all important coastline along the Black Sea. For centuries, Ukraine has served as the link between East and West for the empires that have shaped its history. In the Russian revolution of 1917, the East was taken over by the Soviet Socialist Republic uh, with it being fully incorporated, um, uh, I think around 1922. The Western part of the country, however, did not become part of the Soviet Union until 1945 at the end of the Second World War with some Southern parts of Ukraine going to Romania. As part of the USSR, Ukraine was known as the second Soviet Republic, su such that it was its importance. And it was valued for its industrial and agricultural com contributions to the Soviet economy. The extent to which uh, Russia's aggression has left NATO flank nations feeling vulnerable, resulting in a buildup of NATO troops in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, and Romania. NATO's Eastern defenses are more militarized in response to Putin's invasion uh, than at any time since the height of the Cold War, with Finland and Sweden, again, as I say, um, uh, submitting their bid to join NATO today in the hope of further strengthening security in the Baltic Sea states. As of May, March 23rd, there were 40,000 troops under the direct NATO command along its eastern flank. And an additional 100,000 US troops are deployed throughout Europe. My understanding that prior to the um, Putin's invasion of Ukraine, there were only 4,000 NATO troops um, in, in these same locations. This week's final surrender of the Ukrainian troops in Mariupol, and if you look to the, um, to the left or the right, uh, you'll see, um, I don't know that Mariupol is marked here, um, but it is, uh, it is along, when you go from, um, if you see the Sea of Azov, that is the pathway into the, into the um, Black Sea. And um, it, Mariupol is along um, the coast there. And when, with the, um, with the surrender of Mariupol, it has put Russia one step closer to securing the Ukrainian coastline corridor, linking the Russian Federation to the Black Sea. And we are likely to see escalating Russian attacks on the major seaport of Odessa, which is Ukraine's third largest country, uh, city. I want to point out that um, um, how critical this is because, um, because uh, Ukraine's $4.6 billion of exports of wheat destined for Egypt, Indonesia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Lebanon, leave from key Black seaport cities of Odessa and Mykolaiv. It also has a critical, um, it's in, it critical importance um, for those countries um, 
that may receive lesser um, exports of wheat from Ukraine, uh, but definitely from Russia um, in terms of uh, those in dire need, um, Benin and Somalia um, and the, the Horn of Africa. Um, so uh, it has wide ranging implications for the humanitarian crisis, the global humanitarian crisis. To say that um, Ukraine's history is characterized by a century long road to independence um, is an understatement. It has in, in modern history come under Polish, Polish, Lithuanian, Russian, Austrian, Austro-Hungarian, Soviet and Nazi occupations. The end of the Tsarist Russia and the dawn of the Russian revolution corresponded with a very brief period of Ukrainian independence as the Ukrainian People's Republic from approximately 1918 to 1921. Soon curtailed by the Soviets, this time in Ukrainian history nevertheless set an important precedent demonstrating Ukrainian's desire for a sovereign and independent nation. Notably, it saw the introduction of Ukrainian currency, the hryvna and the Trezub, the emblem derived from the seal trident of Volodymyr the Great, um, still used today as a symbol of Ukrainian national unity. Um, well, the focus, uh, I wanna focus on key events and development since Ukraine's declared independence in August of 1991. It is important to draw attention to the long history of Tsarist and Soviet oppression of U Ukraine. Both the Russian Empire and the Soviet Socialist Republic exercised control over Ukraine's cultural and intellectual production and worked to deny the right of Ukraine to write its own history. Um, and agricultural production and consumption also came under strict control in Stalin's state-imposed collectivization that created an artificial famine between 1932 and 1933 resulting in the death of an estimated 3.5 to 5 million Ukrainians in a genocide now known as the Holodomor. Putin's propaganda narrative denouncing Ukraine's right to exist is set forth in an open letter to the public in July 2021 titled On the Historical Unity of Russia, uh, Russians and Ukrainians. Here he draws on the contested history of medieval state of Kievan Rus, arguing Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians are all descendants of ancient Rus, essentially, he claims, um, uh, descended from a ruler, a Viking ruler who claimed Kiev for its strategic location on the Dnieper River in the ninth century. Um, and so we do know um, that, that Vikings landed in a lot of places, not just um, Ukraine. And so uh, it becomes a bit clouded as to, uh, you know, this in terms of how he builds this narrative. Um, I would also like to add that Hitler also turned to antiquity um, in, in terms of uh, he at one point in, in, in his Third Reich wanted um, Ukrainian women, um, especially those with blonde hair, blue eyes, because he saw these as descendants of the Visigoths and he had ambitions of re-Germanifying them. Um, so uh, before he had forced labor um, deportations uh, under uh, German occupation, he, he encouraged them to come as domestic labor and, and that. And there were a number of women, um, uh, certainly women that I have met who were caught between that, um, between that um, come and come to Germany and work um, and, and also uh, you know, being deported forcibly. Uh, so uh, Putin's ongoing narratives, though aimed at the strategic, at the integration of Ukraine into Russia, is also reflected in, is reflective of empirist historiography or the writing of history and colonizing literatures which conceive of Russia as an organic nation, a living entity whereby constitutive parts with Mother Russia as its head and Ukraine as one of its limbs are interdependent and where no possible conflict of, conflict of interest can exist. Um, this idea of an organic Russia essentially becomes Putin's pretext for invading Ukraine that he laid out in the same public address in which he declares, quote, true sovereignty is possible only in partnership with Russia. We are one people, unquote. As we look at the events documenting Ukraine's post-independence, we will see that this is the same idea of no possible conflict underscores Putin's objection to Ukraine moving closer and closer to Europe, 
and further from Russia. In the colonizing literatures of Imperial Russia, Ukraine is constructed as a frontier, antiquated, rural, and often violent and in desperate need of assimilation. Here again, we see how Putin has rhetorically leveraged these patronizing themes in his persistent and unfounded claim that Ukraine is somehow out of control and requires denazification. Uh, Post-independence uh, Ukraine has hardly been clear sailing. Um, Ukraine's road to a democratic sovereign nation has been marked by corruption, economic mismanagement, and an ongoing Russian interference as documented within the events leading up to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. In an attempt to answer the question, why now? I want to draw your attention to several key events on a 30 year timeline from 1991 to present day. Um, in, uh, amid the dissolution of the Soviet Union, um, a declaration of independence was approved by the Verkhovna Rada in August 1991. Ukraine votes for independence in a referendum held later in December 1st, uh, with 92% supporting independence. There was an 84% voter turnout, and I think it's important to note that in all regions of Ukraine, um, there was a majority in support of um, of uh, independence, um, including Crimea, where uh, the population is was is typically ethnically uh, Russian. Um, I think they they were probably the the lowest percentage in support, but it was like fifty four percent. The West was predictably really strong in support, above ninety percent. But even the East um, yielded percentages of of over eighty percent in support of independence. Um, within three years, uh, uh, by 1994, efforts were already underway for Ukraine to uh, give up its nuclear weapons in exchange for uh, security provisions. So the Russian, Ukrainian, and U.S. presidents uh, signed a, a statement in, on January 14, 1994, um, reaffirming Ukraine's commitment to transfer all strategic nuclear warheads to Russia and dismantle strategic launchers in its territory. This statement, and it's an important one, also confirms Russia's intention to compensate Ukraine for the value of the uranium in the warheads, and U.S. signals its readiness to assist Ukraine in dismantling the launchers, and specifies security assurances for Ukraine once it accedes to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty as a non-nuclear weapons state. At the same time, um, the NATO welcomes Ukraine into its Partnership for Peace, a collaborative arrangement open to all non-NATO European countries and post-Soviet states. Um, members, uh, Russia too also becomes a member that June and conducts various uh, cooperative activities with NATO, including joint military exercises until, as we will see, 2014 with its illegal annexation of Crimea, when NATO formally suspends its ties with Russia. Um, as the Cold War ended, um, there is uh, Russia continually um, uh, thwarts and has opposed the Eastern expansion of NATO. Um, and we see that kind of uh, the, the, um, the threats that, um, uh, and the tensions that are ensuing right now um, with, uh, with um, more nations looking towards NATO to join, right? And also the buildup, obviously, of the troops in, in NATO flank countries. Um, I think uh, this eventually leads later this that year, again, we're still in 1994, to what is known as the Budapest Memorandum on Security Assurances, in which Russia, Ukraine, the United Kingdom, and United States following Ukraine's accession to the NPT as a non-nuclear weapon state, agreed to commit to respecting, and this is key, Ukraine's sovereignty, territorial integrity, and independence, and promise not to threaten or to use force against Ukraine. And Russia signed it. Mm -hmm. um, in, um, I, I'll bring sort of draw your attention to what many maybe put Ukrainian on the map in terms of the Western psyche. Um, uh, there was the Orange Revolution, 
um, in 2004, that began in 2004, um, in which the 2004 presidential race pitted Western-oriented uh, Viktor Yuchenko against Viktor Yanukovych. Um, Yanukovych is a Kuchma, um, the uh, a, uh, in, in the a present president's uh, uh, preferred choice and the candidate supported by Moscow. Um, it, uh, mis uh, during this time, okay, during the campaign, Yuchenko mysteriously suffers dioxin poisoning in September. He survives, but with his face disfigured. Um, there were two flawed rounds of voting which awarded the election to Yanukovych. Protesters immediately took to the streets and dressed in orange. Um, Yuchenko's campaign color um, and forced a revote in December, which Yuchenko wins. Um, the second so called color revolution in a post Soviet state, a year after Georgia's Rose Revolution, sets off um, warnings to Moscow that, um, you know, that it isn't as easy any longer to place a pro Russian um, a candidate. Um, uh, in, in government or in presidential positions, um, but also that there is a growing um, autonomy amongst uh, citizens um, in claiming, um, uh, in claiming, uh, uh, or in, in self-determination in terms of their governments. Uh, there is, um, mm, there are, uh, in, in moving up, say, but in 2008, okay, uh, NATO begins uh, uh, its 22nd summit and amid a debate about whether it should offer what is called membership action plans. Well, these are four run runners to NATO memberships to Croatia, Georgia, and Ukraine. Um, but here's one instance where um, uh, um, Russian President Vladimir Putin expressed opposition to extending um, MAPs to Georgia and Ukraine um, uh, uh, sort of results in a stalemate and, and uh, NATO is unable to reach a consensus. NATO members declined to offer an MAP to either. Um, during a separate meeting at this time, Putin reportedly tells US President George W. Bush that Ukraine is, quote, not even a real nation state, unquote. Um, this is closely followed by, uh, um, that, that took place in April 2008. By August 2008, Russia had invaded Georgia. Okay. And um, again, looked at increased Russian presence in breakaway um, republics um, in, and, uh, and, uh, and actually, um, he subsequently recognized, Russia recognizes both republics as independent states. The same kind of thing that he is, uh, is attempting to do obviously in Ukraine um, in the area of the Donbass. Um, and though neither is recognized as an independent state by, by most countries. So uh, uh, there is that, uh, you know, it's been done before. So a lot of things that we're happening seeing in Ukraine have been um, tried out before um, without sometimes without any impunity. Um, uh, there is uh, in September, 2008 um, talks open in uh, on the new European Union relationship. This is a time I remember um, a great deal. Um, I was in Ukraine um, for a number of years um, from 2007, especially between 2007 and 2010. And um, a lot of the conferences, academic conferences that I attended um, centered on EU integration. Um, the EU and Ukraine begin talks on new association agreements and issue um, uh, a communique that Ukraine's future is in Europe. The US, EU considers such agreements to be legally binding contracts that commit countries to developing closer political, legal, and trading ties in EU. And here I would add education, as much of the um, discussion had to do with the implementation of the Bologna process, um, so that there were sort of standard outcomes for K-12 and uh, higher education across the European countries, um, with an emphasis, too, on plurilingualism and global participation. Uh, by February 7th, 2010, Yanukovych um, is elected president, um, and uh, I will skip the bit about um, uh, Yulia Timoshenko, who was imprisoned, but it's an important piece as well. Um, but I'm leading up to what is, to my mind, a major key event, um, and that is that um, just before signing 
um, or in negotiations with signing um, uh, uh, a European Union um, agreement, uh, Yanukovych withdraws from the EU talks and says it will not sign the association agreement at an upcoming EU-Ukraine summit in Lithuania. And Yanukovych's administration announces it will resume dialogue with Russia instead about joining the Eurasian customs units. Protests begin in Kiev almost immediately. Um, and to learn more about this event um, in, in quite, uh, I would say, graphic detail as well, is to watch the Netflix um, documentary uh, that is airing right now, Winter on Fire. Um, and uh, it, it's an excellent piece and it gives you a sense, especially if you have some background now, um, to watch it um, uh, uh, um, you know, in a way that, that you might not have been able to do before. Um, the Euromaidan protests, um, and Maidan is independence, it's a rallying point, it's independence square, um, and um, led to eventually lead to government collapse. Um, Ukrainians turn out in large numbers uh, to protest Yanukovych's announcement on EU ties, mostly peaceful demonstrations. These were mostly university students and I will also say that a lot of them were, um, were likely participants in my projects um, for two months in Kiev's, Kiev's main Maidan Square. Um, they turn violent when the government moves to break up protesters and list the aides of what is called the, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Burkut or Burkot, who, who um, are a militarized police. Um, the ensuing crackdown kills more than 100 people. On February 21st, Yanukovych and opposition readers, uh, leaders read a settlement that includes plans for presidential elections before the end of the year. In other words, uh, we're in February and they said, well, we'll have a, an election at the end of the year. This did not appease the protesters. Um, it raised their ire even more. Uh, soon after, uh, Yanukovych flees to Russia and um, Ukraine's acting president and acting prime minister make it clear that a top priority will be to bring Ukraine closer to Europe. Um, um, Russia responds immediately in the wake of the ousting of Yanukovych and the Euromaidan revolution, and he seizes Crimea and holds a referendum. So pro-Russian forces, including um, uh, Russian soldiers in Russian uniforms, but with identifying insignia removed, seize control of Crimea, um, where the majority of residents are ethnically Russian. Soon after, authorities hold a disputed referendum in which Crimean voters choose to succeed and join Russia. Brussels um, calls the referendum illegal and illegitimate, and uh, uh, Russia annexes Crimea on March 21st, though the UN General Assembly votes 100 to 11 against recognizing the referendum results. Russia is expelled at this time from the group of eight, the G8, and uh, a month later, and Putin admits that Russian soldiers were involved in the annexation and justifies it as a way to protect Russian, uh, ethnic Russians, which is the rhetoric that he's using right now to, um, in the Donbass, allegedly threatened by violence from Kyiv. And uh, at this point, there were some minor sanctions applied, but nothing here that really would have been, uh, I don't want to say a deterrent, but nothing that, that has, I guess, deterred um, uh, uh, Putin from pushing further. Okay. So he also blocked backs, Russia blocked backs a bloody separatist war. Uh, it provokes an armed separatist movement to see, see, seize government buildings across Eastern Ukraine's Donbass region. So Ukrainian forces resist, but are conscious of, of provoking a much wider war. Um, what happens is for, since 2014, fighting has not ceased in the Donbass uh, and, um, it has resulted prior to the present invasion of uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It has resulted in more than 14,000 deaths 
a quarter of them civilians, and two million internally displaced Ukrainians. So for um, a, a week or so ago, I was on um, a discussion with two um, Ukrainian writers from the Donbass region, both of whom are living in and around Kyiv right now. Uh, but for them and the people of the Donbass, the, the actions that are happening right now are a continuation in their minds of what's been going on since 2014. Um, there is also a sense that the world needed to pay attention um, or greater attention or exert greater pressures on Russia after the annexation of, uh, of um, Crimea. Um, and I, there are a number of other um, um, events, of course, um, in the interim, but I'm, I'm moving right to uh, the uh, election of Volodymyr Zelensky, um, who wins a presidential runoff with more than 70% of the vote defeating Poroshenko. Um, two months later, Zelensky's party, and this is an, again an, an important point, also wins a majority of parliamentary seats, marking the first time since independence that Ukraine's president has a majority party in parliament. Zelensky had campaigned against the corruption and poverty and pledged to end the war in the East. Many saw the vote as a rejection of uh, Poroshenko's failure to root out co corruption. Um, I think if there's a major takeaway here, I want to really underscore that uh, uh, you know, the biggest fear or the biggest threat to Putin and Russia is the extent to which Zelensky, a Russian speaking Jewish president has been successful in uniting Ukrainian and Russian speaking uh, Ukrainians in defining for the world Ukraine as a democratic sovereign nation and one that can work. Um, I see that I'm, I'm at sort of 1230. Um, and so I, I did wanna make a comment um, uh, with your permission um, about, the, um, about the humanitarian crisis um, in, uh, that, that is re resulting from the, uh, uh, that is resulting from the present action. Um, and um, I was on, again, there was a webinar with the Association of American Universities in which um, Volodymyr Zelensky um, addressed uh, um, uh, key presidents of, of major institutions throughout the United States. So it was really interesting to hear him talk directly to, um, uh, to um, post-secondary institutions um, with uh, students in mind. But I do want to say that with respect to the humanitarian crisis, um, there are several unique features of this conflict. One is the rapidity of the movement of people. Uh, the latest numbers from the United Nations, and they change constantly, indicate that the ensuing conflict has meant that in a country of 44 million people, on a land mass the size, the, the size of the state of Texas, more than 13 million have now abandoned their homes, of which 6.2 million have fled to neighboring countries and some to countries abroad. And according to a study by the International Organization for Migration, a further 8 million people have been internally displaced. ID people, IDPs are primarily from Eastern regions of the country, as you saw the Donbass, uh, seeking safety in Central and Western Ukraine. 90% um, is expected of all refugees are women and children because um, uh, men between the ages of 18 and 60 are required to stay and fight. A second distinguishing feature of the conflict and one that invariably contributes to the ability of its population to migrate rapidly, unlike other areas of conflict uh, uh, and refugees, say for example, from Syria, Yemen and Tigray, who have endured extended periods of conflict or continue to experience dire need. Um, Ukrainians prior to the invasion have benefited from a longstanding or well-established system of social safety nets support baseline health and are overall a healthy population. More than one observer has noted, for example, how well and warmly the children are dressed, despite the haste in which they have had to leave their homes. And thirdly, it is undeniable that the international response to the crisis in Ukraine has been a vigorous one. Um, and I do want to underscore that there are still places throughout the world that are in dire need. 
And so that we always have to keep vigilant. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's not just that one crisis replaces another. We need to know more about countries that we haven't traditionally known a lot about um, and, and to understand how, um, and how we can best uh, help or alleviate the situations. Um, so one of the, those contributing factors is identification. So a lot of the welcoming countries um, are um, ones that border with Ukraine, of course. A lot of them are themselves post-Soviet nations. Um, even the emails that I've received from, from people across the Europe community, many of them, uh, they or their parents have, have come from those co countries who have suffered under those oppressions and, and are, um, are uh, of course, uh, can identify with what is happening in Ukraine right now and have been opening their doors. Um, uh, I, uh, during that association to the AAU, President Volodymyr Zelensky also drew attention to the 500,000 approximately that we know of Ukrainian nationals believed to have been forcibly deported to Russia, to the Russian Federation. This is something that forced deport deportation is also something that Stalin resorted to, um, including as many as 210,000 children and many torn from shelters in the besieged city, uh, city of Mariupol. Um, again, um, I, I, the, the latest news coming out is, of course, um, uh, the, um, the efforts underway uh, to investigate war crimes. Um, there is a possible, and uh, you know, I can't find the number now. Um, it's it's in the hundreds of thousands already of possible war crimes that are being investigated, um, and uh, um, I fear that. Um, we will uh, also uncover more, especially um, in, uh, in, in the, the, the absolutely destroyed city that it's been pulverized, Mariupol. Um, so I, I do want to thank you um, very, very much for your attention. I know this has been, you know, sort of a speed course here. Um, I, I want to say dujujakuyu, thank you, merci and miigwech, and, um, and welcome any questions that you might have. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Krasny, for the very timely and informative talk. We, we really appreciate you spending this time with our community. And questions have already started coming in. Um, and I will, uh, I'll read them out on behalf of our audience um, who's, who's been paying close attention. Um, for audience members who have additional questions, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. Uh, if you're watching live on Facebook, you're welcome to submit any questions or comments through the comment section for the video. So actually our first question comes in from Facebook and uh, the question was, if you could please elaborate on the financial part of the color revolutions. Okay, I wish I could. I, I, I wanna say that I, I can in terms of the financial, did you say the financial part? Yeah, there may be people better equipped than, than I am. Um, uh, I will have to say that a, a ton of the students that I um, met and worked with were economic majors, but that's sort of not, I, 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 I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of ill-equipped to respond to that question, I have to say. Yeah. No worries, I, I'm, I'm not either. Um, okay, another question coming in from Sylvia. Uh, Sylvia asks, how responsible do you think we are for getting to this point where Russia felt comfortable to invade? Also, what can we do and maintain to ensure this never happens again? Yeah, um, I, I tell you, um, the, the idea of never happening again, I teach a, a course in reading the Holocaust in memory. And one of the big things we do is interrogate um, the, the, I don't want to say complacency, but our, our blind faith that we have, that, that things will never happen again. I think it requires our vigilance at all times. Um, and I, I think, um, uh, I think it is, you know, from a philosophical point of view uh, that we assume responsibility for the other. And um, I, I worry now with growing sort of, um, um, you know, uh, nationalistic agendas, um, a growing number of autocracies and things like that, um, uh, that, that we're going to lose that capacity. Um, I mean, media can be a double-edged sword in some respects. Um, and I think that we need to use it in productive ways uh, to understand each other better and build intercultural relations. Um, if you're asking in terms of what kinds of responsibilities we take, um, I think, 
we always have to um, uh, self-examine, self-reflect. Um, I, I mean, isn't that the whole center point too? I mean, when we look at reconciliation, and I, I think that word reconciliation is a really important word and that, that it has application um, uh, to our relations um, with each other. Um, I, I think that there were opportunities. Um, without a doubt, I think there were opportunities to act, okay? Um, and so I'm part of an extended Ukrainian diaspora here in the West, and, and we live in Toronto as well. Um, and, uh, and to, you know, these are things that we talk about all the time, and we think to ourselves, why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that? Why didn't they intervene? Um, I mean, there are lobbying groups. There are Ukrainians in Canada, um, are one are a very powerful diaspora, um, and so they they do respond to things that they see. They they are the third force in forging a multicultural framework within uh, uh, multiculturalism within a bilingual framework, which is a bit of an oxymoron. But in any event, uh, but they do have they do have some political clout, um, and so we hope um, and, and that that um, there are key players. I think that we can um, access. Um, who who can I have been pleased actually with the um, with the response of Canada in in some respects, uh, but definitely when we look and, and again we're looking retrospectively what could have been done better. Thank you for that thoughtful response. Um, I'm gonna we're, we're getting some really tough questions in the chat, so I'm I'm gonna try them and then um, you know, but they're a little bit uh, asking to uh, predict the future. So Irk asks a question for thinking, says, thank you very much, Dr. Krasny for your talk. I'm wondering whether you can offer some thoughts on how you see the war unfolding and how might it be resolved? Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I, I I think about it all the time. I mean, it is, um, I have to uh, sort of, and, and I now realize how, um, I mean, uh, I, how even when I've, listened, um, uh, you know, uh, since, uh, since I've been a young person, I've been watching revolutions across the world, um, displaced persons, um, refugee crises and things like that. And, and because this one happens to be also deeply personal, and I think everybody's situation should be deeply personal, um, that, that there is a little, a, a layer of our, another layer to our existence that, that occupies a lot of our conversation. Um, I watch diligently and you know, I'm encouraged by some things. In terms of it turning, it, it, I, I do believe that um, Ukraine has a resolve that is seldom witnessed. Um, I, I think that um, uh, there are, of course, those shots that bring tears to the eyes. I think that in terms of unity, I have never seen a population that where the youth and the old and the aged will work together, okay? Um, to that extent, I'm sure that it may exist elsewhere, uh, but it is um, this caring for each other. Um, and that, uh, you know, if there are youth protesters out there, then there are um, older people bringing soup and things to the line. And they did this and they, until it wasn't possible anymore, I think, in this situation. Um, if you ask me how it's unfolding, I honestly can't predict. I do fear. I have fears that this is a war of attrition. Um, I am uh, very fearful of um, uh, that um, that gains made uh, along the Black Sea coast will eventually, um, if successful, uh, Russian gains made will leave uh, Ukraine a landlocked country. Okay, um, and uh, that um, that I do fear for um, uh, for contiguous expansion uh, or attempts at contiguous expansion, whether that happens in the near future or or in years ahead, um, that's a different question. Uh, I, I really can't say um, uh, whether or not. I mean, uh, Belarus is strategically, of course, uh, located uh, borders Ukraine. Um, it, it's in an interesting position insofar as Lukashenko uh, has uh, been president, but he was not necessarily elected by or had the support of the people. Um, and so, um, you know, his efforts to rally troops might be compromised by that or, or maybe have been compromised by that. But I, I fear because that is a, a strategic location to, um, to enter Ukraine from a different access uh, in a stronger way. Um, I am um, 
uh, I'm incredibly attached to the city of Lviv and um, uh, to, I have heard that there are now more explosions going off. Um, I am, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of stating the world's worries. I'm, a, I'm worried about hypersonic uh, missiles and thermobaric um, weapons and, and of course the, the, the whole nuclear threat. I, I mean, we all are. Um, so I don't want to get into the kind of apop apocalyptic sort of visions, but there, there is, um, um, I mean, I think we're always mindful of what is out there. I'm also very hopeful. I am very, very hopeful. Um, and I, uh, of, of people, you know, breaking through and getting out the message. Um, and uh, uh, so we're, you know, it's a very complicated situation. I think Russia is becoming an increasingly darker space as we all see. Um, and so those kinds of things, um, uh, you know, there, there are things that, that we never considered before in terms of how much is, uh, um, you know, that we use uh, that is a media warfare, those kinds of things. Yeah, I mean, there's just so much. I don't know that I could call it any better than that. Sorry. No. Yeah, no, I certainly hear that mix of, of very real fear and again, hope um, together. Uh, and, and, and then you just spoke of media and that brings us to uh, another question that came in from Lerd, which is actually asking, does the existence of social media, in your opinion, help hinder or help the situation now in Ukraine? Oh, I mean, it's like anything else. I mean, uh, it has it's it has the potential to be liberating and at the same time, a potential to to um, uh, to oppress. Um, and and, uh, and I mean, it is uh, that's why it requires our, our diligence. It, it also requires, I think, from a post secondary standpoint and everything that, that we need all um, uh, we need the humanities more than ever, I think, in some respects, um, in order to um, uh, to decipher those things. We need uh, people who are uh, in terms of, uh, of a you know, we've been talking about digital futures in terms of surveillance, um, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, how do we how do we have the uh, information and the, the correct information um, uh, and how, how can we access it? Um, but how do we uh, interpret that information? Okay, and so it's becoming harder and harder. Um, the kinds of uh, fake news kinds of things are in incredibly sophisticated. Um, we saw the woman from the the pregnant woman from Mariupol, who was then uh, forcibly transported to to Russia. Who I heard that that appeared sort of you know either doctored or pressured into you know denying that 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 a, a maternity hospital was was bombed. Those kinds of things. So, uh, I mean, I am, I, I have, I, I will admit I'm on a constant Reddit feed. And again, I wait until I, it, it, sometimes I get news stories a little bit harder, faster maybe, or we get them. But, but again, they almost all need verification um, before, you know, that I'll, I'll cite them or I'll look for them, be, or, you know, because it's, um, you know, and you, you do the best you can. You you keep looking and you keep seeing from reliable sources, but but reliable sources can be compromised as well. Uh, so yeah, it it it. I can't say like I say. It requires our attention. It requires our thought. It isn't. It, it's how we use those instruments. I think. Thank you for that. Um, unfortunately, we are running out of time, and there are many questions coming in. So I'm going to. Um, end with a last question or two. Um, and I apologize that we don't have more time because we could probably talk about this endlessly. Um, but I want to ask about, about NATO. And Stanley's asking, do you foresee any chance of Ukraine becoming part of NATO in the, in the foreseeable future, especially if part of Ukraine is, uh, is lost to Russia? Or And, and maybe you could also comment on the buildup of, of um, troops in NATO flank countries. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good question because um, one of the things that Putin asked for at the beginning is he wanted um, uh, he wanted um, neutrality. Okay, he wanted um, denazification, which it just you know uh, I I don't want to sort of you know kind of give it credence in any way, shape, or form by by even mentioning it. But and he also asked for the recognition of Crimea. And um, one of the the gentlemen uh, who was presenting um, on a panel that I watched um, uh, with the Harvard Universe uh, Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute um, uh, had mentioned, and he was. Uh, 
an, uh, an economics professor, but he was also within um, uh, Zelensky's inner circle and an advisor and those things. He said, you know, Putin asked for what he already had. I mean, Ukrainian, Ukraine wasn't, uh, and there was um, uh, obviously, um, I had mentioned overtures to, to joining the EU. I think that was the biggest thing. And that's just from my perspective. Um, I think that the, the NATO piece, they were, I think they would have been happy with the, the being um, uh, new, neutral, right? Um, had in some respects, Russia kept up its side of the bargain and not invaded and seized um, uh, uh, Crimea after signing the Bucharest, uh, um, uh, the Budapest, sorry, the Budapest uh, memorandum, right? It, that was supposed to ensure um, Ukraine's uh, territorial um, sovereignty, integrity and sovereignty, and um, uh, uh, give it uh, security assurances. So I think that that it is, um, and I don't, I mean, it is sort of a bit of a, a, a game here, I think, in terms of, I mean, I would imagine that Putin knew full well that, um, that uh, obviously invading would, would kind of re-spark interest in joining NATO. Um, but the gentleman that came in, it's Timofey, I forget his last name, he, he said, you know, he pretty much had what he was asking for, right? Because there was no such thing as the need for de denazification. Um, uh, Ukraine was already neutral, right? And, um, and he was already sitting in Crimea. So, um, and there weren't any repercussions from that. So um, I think that, um, uh, there is a possibility, uh, but I think right now um, the, the, um, the Ukrainian government is um, intent on seeing its country through um, this war, right, and, and coming out victorious. Um, and I think those kinds of things are something for the table later. I think, yeah. I mean, there has been a lot of talk about, of course, the closing the airspace and things. Um, and, and that's a really difficult one to, to entangle. Um, I have thought of uh, in terms of, uh, and also the new question is with the buildup of troops, um, whether or not that this might be increasing tensions. And, and you know, I mean, we see that, that Russia is looking for a provocation here. Um, and, uh, but again, um, you know, it is a, a question of, of holding your ground, I think, too. Thank you for that. So um, I'll end by asking, you know, here in here in Canada, um, what can we do? What can we do to help um, support Ukraine and the humanitarian efforts? Well, that's a really good one. Um, OK, so um, I do want to say that um, uh, um, I know at the very beginning I was inundated with from a re requests from people who, who thought I could, you know, set them up, even myself and my husband. And, and I had even thought about going to Poland and things like that after because uh, I'm in Europe this summer. But um, uh, really, there is a, a humanitarian architecture uh, or, or um, uh, yeah, architecture that I think um, it, on, a, on a, a crisis this scale, um, that uh, in terms of what you can personally do, um, I, I'm a big believer in the Red Cross and Les Médecins Sans Frontières, um, and uh, that they will get the needed goods. Um, so many times, and I've been involved with this um, uh, uh, in the wake of the Romanian Revolution in terms of that, is when the people on the receiving end don't all, it's, they can't always um, process the goods that you're sending in the first place, right? And I think we're kind of past that point as well. Um, I think that um, in terms of the academy and what I see, um, what I see uh, people doing um, uh, or, or universities, uh, both American and Canadian institutions, what I am seeing is that uh, there are, first of all, um, unequivocal, clear uh, statements condemning um, the invasion of Ukraine. Um, and also, um, I want to uh, shout out to the um, people, the, the library, York libraries, for putting together, and this is a massive effort on the part of Mary Ken Duke and, um, and uh, her colleagues and um, a dean of libraries who supports this because a lot of institutions have uh, a faculty or a department of Slavic studies and things like that is to inform yourself, right? Um, and because these are difficult conversations that you're going to have with your students. Um, I would say reach out um, if you can to Ukrainian colleagues. Um, there are uh, programs underway and I'm just learning about them now in terms of how to support um, 
um, uh, Ukrainian students who have been displaced by the war, who were in the midst of their programs, of, of their master's program, of their undergraduate studies. Um, we also have, of course, uh, students, international students, and I'm sure York International is probably keeping track of those uh, students who are stuck here, okay, or that cannot return. And, and how can we assist that way? And, and there are, um, I know I'm aware of others that um, that are there. I, I do want to say, I, I, and whether you are, um, I think I mentioned this in the midst of my thing, whether you, oh, I talk, if whether you are, um, uh, um, you know, supporting um, those fleeing from Ukraine or in, in those kinds of humanitarian efforts, um, or also we have, you know, refugees waiting to get in here. We have um, people from Afghanistan still waiting. I, 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 what, I, what I guess I'm saying to people is don't forget. Don't forget we have people everywhere. Um, there is dire need in, in, in so many places in the world. Um, anything you can do is always, is always helpful. Um, uh, um, so I, I thank you for the question. <laughs> Well, thank you, Dr. Krasny, for spending this time with us and sharing um, your insight, the history and, and, and views. It's very much appreciated. I, I wish we had more time, but we will have to uh, conclude this. So, uh, so thank you on behalf of the York University community. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Merci. Thank you. Duje Jacu. Merci. Okay, you can now turn off your camera and Mike and I'll just uh, conclude the event. Okay. Um, so thank you to our audience for being here. Uh, for those of you who would like to share today's session with family and friends, it will, as always, be posted to our YouTube page, which is youtube.com forward slash York U alumni. You can also watch past lectures you may have missed there. We have a final poll question for you, and it should pop up. How would you rate your knowledge of today's topic following this discussion? So it's popped up on your screen. Let us know. Our next Scholars Hub at Home session is tomorrow in time for World Bee Day this Friday. It's titled Be the Change with Dr. Sheila Kola, who's an associate professor at the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change and Dr. Amro Zayed, professor at the Faculty of Science. Then we'll be back two weeks after that with Professor Jen Gilbert, who teaches in our Faculty of Education and we'll be discussing pandemic possibilities, sexuality, gender and youth in the time of COVID. Um, you can register and learn more about these sessions at yorku.ca slash alumni and friends. Thank you all for participating and we wish you all the best, be well.